Nicole and Smith both lived in a city hostel. These individuals decided to go out to eat one evening. They rode their bikes outside at 11 p.m. to eat in this manner. Smith told Nicole to take the short forest path after supper so he could get to his hostel as soon as possible. Nicole, on the other hand, refused and stated that this route should not be taken because it passes through an abandoned cemetery. Smith informs him that it is on the right side of the forest, whereas we will be traversing the left. Nicole agreed with him, and they both went down this road. They arrived near the abandoned cemetery after some time on that path. Nicole announced immediately that we had arrived at the cemetery. According to Smith, the cemetery should have been on the opposite side of the forest. What brought it here? Nicole orders him to leave the area immediately, fearing for his safety. Nicole noticed movement in the cemetery as soon as Smith reversed the bicycle. Nicole tightened his grip on Smith's shoulders when he noticed this, prompting Smith to inquire. What's the matter with you? Why are you putting so much pressure on my shoulders? Nicole informs him, terrified, that he has just seen movement in the cemetery. Smith then inquired as to the location of the movement. There is someone in the cemetery over there, said Nicole, motioning to him. Smith became terrified upon hearing this and stated that he does not wish to observe anything. We should leave this area as soon as possible because I'm starting to get scared. Nicole stated that there is someone present on this occasion. When Smith looked there, he found nothing. However, Nicole stated numerous times that there is someone present there. Can't you see? Smith claimed, I can't see anything. What do you see? Nicole claims, a white cloth moving to the right and left on a regular basis. After hearing this, Smith became even more terrified. Nicole began telling Smith to leave immediately. Smith left after Nicole repeated this several times. Nicole eventually heard a sound in his ear, as if someone is telling him, stop or else I'll kill you. Nicole became terrified when he heard this and began yelling, go fast, at Smith. Then Smith inquired as to what occurred. Smith's gaze was drawn to the bike's mirror. He noticed a woman in white chasing him through the air. When Smith saw this, he became terrified and increased the speed of the bike. Fearful, they arrived at their hostel, went to their room, and fell asleep after locking the gate. The next day, a college holiday, they both left for home, promising not to tell anyone about the incident. The next day, Smith receives a phone call, and when he answers it, he discovers that it's Nicole's mother. Picking up the phone, Nicole's mother informs Smith that he hasn't eaten or spoken to anyone since Nicole returned home. He spends the entire day in his room, and there's a sound of someone talking to someone from his room in the middle of the night while no one is in his room. Do you know anything about it? Smith became terrified and reported the incident to Nicole's mother. His mother was also terrified upon hearing this information. She reprimanded Smith, saying that, All this occurred and you didn't tell anyone? What if something terrible were to occur? Smith stated that, Because we were terrified, we did not tell anyone. Nicole was conversing with another individual in his room, while his mother listened in through the door on the same evening. She entered the room because she did not comprehend anything. Inside, they observed Nicole standing in a dark corner with his back to the wall and mumbling. They observed Nicole standing in a dark corner with his back to the wall and mumbling. Nicole, what are you talking about? Questioned his mother. Nicole did not respond, but he did stop babbling. Tell me, who are you talking to? She inquired. That's when Nicole shouted, Leave me in that cemetery and come, old lady. That is my residence. I'll bring your child with me. Nicole's tone of voice had changed. His eyes turned red and his voice sounded as if two to three people were saying all of this at the same time. Nicole collapsed unconscious after saying all of this. His mother became terrified and picked him up and made him lie on the bed. Then she called her husband and told him everything. Nicole's father returned from work after an hour. Nicole's mother started crying and asked, what happened to our son? When she sees him, please correct it. Nicole is driven to church by his parents the next day. 
The priest places his hand on Nicole's head, closes her eyes, and then opens her eyes and declares that he is possessed by a witch. She had followed it out of the cemetery and it returned to him. She would also like to accompany him to the cemetery. Nicole's mother burst into tears upon hearing this. She asked the priest, Save my son. According to the priest, this witch followed your son sent to your house. As a result, its odor must drive it away. You dispose of his clothing from today in the same cemetery without washing it. Don't worry, I'll keep the witch until you return with the clothes. You must, however, complete the task tonight only. Nicole's parents became enraged upon hearing this and brought his clothes to the cemetery that night to be stored there. We left your victim in the graveyard. You should leave, the priest responded. Do not return again. After that, the witch returned to the abandoned graveyard. Nicole was now free of the witch's clutches. The priest advised Nicole's family that your son should never take that road by accident. After saying this, the priest sent all three of them out of the church and they returned home happy. From a very young age, the kids of my town were asked to stay away from the woods. I remember my grandma telling me to play in the park where all the other kids were, rather than venturing into the woods, especially in the evening or at night. I grew up with a fear of the woods and what lurked inside them. The fear only got prominent as I became older. So when I took up the job of a firefighter in our town's fire department, I knew one of these days I would be forced to go into the woods. My grandma used to tell me stories about the woods and how an evil lived inside it. It was rumored that she killed and ate anyone who crossed her path. So not even the elders of the town went into the forest. Our town was small and surrounded by forest from three sides. All the people in the town avoided the forest like a plague and only entered to get wood sometimes. Over the years, my grandma had told me many stories about the witch. The first time I stepped into the forest was on a very stressful day. The south side of the forest was on fire and the fire was spreading pretty fast. It was my job to scout the woods and warn the hikers to get back to the town as soon as possible. I was terrified as hell, but decided to step into the forest nonetheless. The forest had many unmarked trails and I decided to stick to the one that seemed the biggest of them all. I had a dirt bike which I rode into the forest slowly looking for the hikers. As I kept going on into the interior of the forest, the trees around me got thicker. The sunlight did not reach the ground due to dense overhanging branches which made the forest floor dark. I remembered my training and kept my cool as I rode inside. There was no trace of any hikers, so I knew they must be deep in the forest. I needed to reach them before it was too late. The radio I was using to communicate with my team had lost range a few meters back, but I kept on proceeding. A mile after that, I spotted a small wooden house. The house looked like someone lived in it. My first thought was that maybe a hunter had built a cabin to live out here while he was busy chopping wood or maybe it was a resting spot for the hikers. I parked my dirt bike against a tree and walked near the house. The door to the house was shut and a metal chain was wrapped around the handle to prevent anyone from entering. However, the window beside the door was made up of glass and I peeked through it. The house was one big room and it looked like someone had lived in it recently. There was a small bed in one corner and an old wooden table. There was no separate kitchen but a small stove in another corner. It seemed like an ordinary hunting cabin until I spotted a small shelf tucked beside the bed that had several jars filled with murky liquid and what was stored in the jars scared the shit out of me. Inside each jar, was a small portion of human body parts. One of the jars had a finger, the other had an ear. One of them had an eye, while another had a nose. I was repelled by looking at it, and I instantly knew I hadn't stumbled upon a hunter's pad. Rather, it was the witch's home. As soon as that realization hit me, I ran towards my dirt bike, hopped on it, and drove off. A few meters away in the tree line, I spotted a white wild cat running parallel to my bike. If I sped up, it sped up. If I slowed down, the cat slowed down too. It was weird as animals in the forest 
generally run away from people. But this cat seemed to follow me. I kept my cool and thought about the hikers I needed to reach. I kept on riding my bike and suddenly the cat ran faster as it seemed to be moving in my direction rather than parallel to me. It was running a few meters away from me and it leapt upon a big tree that was 15 meters ahead of me. The cat climbed the tree and sat on the branch that hung right above the path of my dirt bike. Now I was forced to pass from below it. The cat stared at me with its big yellow eyes. It did not meow, rather it hissed at me. It was a very weird cat. I stood there looking at it for several minutes and then finally decided to keep moving. The cat did not take its eyes off me while I passed from the road below. As soon as I passed the cat, I sped up and rushed forward. However, a part of me was compelled to look behind. I turned around and what I saw was enough to knock me off my dirt bike. Perched on the same branch was a freckled old woman wearing a black tunic with long black matted hair looking at me. I barely managed to balance my dirt bike and marched ahead with all I had in me. I had just encountered the witch my grandma had warned me about and she could shapeshift. With sweat running down my forehead and my hands barely managing to hold the handle, I tried my best and kept riding for a few kilometers. Finally, around noon I found the hikers I was looking for. I asked them to wait by the checkpoint where a rescue team was going to pick them up. But now, I had to return through the same route I came from, which meant there was the chance I would encounter the witch again. I started to recite prayers and rode my bike at a much slower pace, trying my best to avoid the witch and her home. But there was no other way out. I had to meet up with the other members of my team on a pre-decided spot. As I came closer, I could see the old wooden house in the tree line, but there was no woman nor cat anywhere to be seen. My first instinct was to look up in the trees, but the tree line was devoid of any animal, human or even bird. I continued praying and sped up once more. As I came near the house, there was pin drop silence, except for the roar of my dirt bike. As I was just about to pass the house, the front wheel of my bike got stuck in a branch and I fell off my bike. Within minutes, the woman was behind me. She threw a rope around my neck trying to choke me. I was struggling to free myself, but she was more powerful. She was slowly dragging me towards her house and I was losing consciousness. But at that moment, before I lost my breath forever, I remembered the pocket knife I had in my back pocket. I removed it and stabbed the witch in her thigh. Her scream echoed through the forest and for a split second, she let go of the rope, clutching her bleeding thigh. I freed myself and stood up, still feeling a bit dazed due to the lack of oxygen. I did not pick up my bike, nor did I bother to take my pocket knife which was still buried in her thigh. I started to run as fast as I could. I could hear rapid footsteps behind me, and as I turned, a big white feral cat was running behind me, waiting to jump on me. However, she wasn't as fast as before, as one of her feet was bleeding profoundly. I managed to cross a distance of a few meters, and suddenly the footsteps stopped. I turned around, and the witch was standing in between two big trees, glaring at me. It seemed like she couldn't cross the threshold of those trees. She was trapped in that part of that forest, and anyone who passed through it was her victim. I was crying tears of relief. Soon, my radio picked up the signal, and I heard one of my teammates say that the fire was contained. I immediately informed them that the hikers were safe and that I needed some assistance to get back to town. Two days later, I woke up in a hospital with my family all around me. I asked for my grandma before speaking to anyone else. I wanted to know the witch's story. For the first time, my grandma told me the truth about the forest witch and why she attacked people. Turns out, she was the daughter of one of the founding members of our town. She was an introverted girl with a speaking disability, which made her a great disappointment to her family. Many kids in town mocked and bullied her. But as she got older, she found solace in the woods. But on one evening while she was strolling in the woods, some kids from the village played a prank on her, due to which she fell from a tree 
and hurt her head pretty badly. She did recover physically, but the fall had traumatized her to the extent that she hated the sight of people and started practicing black magic. As the years passed, she moved into the forest and hardly ever came out. She perceived all the people as a threat, and that's why she attacked anyone who passed through her territory. She kills people and eats their flesh, and stores their body parts in the jar for her rituals. People call her a witch as she is a cannibal and had dark powers. Years have passed since my encounter with the forest witch, but to date, people go missing in the forest. And I still think about what would have been my fate if I wasn't able to escape. In the early 2000s, when I was a much younger man, I started a new job in the south of London. I had not long finished college in Somerset, where I had grown up. My mother and father had both been murdered when I was a child, so I had been living in foster care, moved from one house to the other a lot when I was a child. I knew that my real parents would have wanted me to find a good job and make something of myself. I was determined to do so. I found out that I had a family member when I was about 18 years old. It was an uncle, but he lived down in the south of the UK in London. I managed to get hold of him, but I can't remember how. He told me in a letter to come down and meet him so I could get a job at a local power station that would be hiring soon, and I jumped at the chance, so I decided to go for it. I had never traveled by myself so far on the trains before, and to say that I was nervous about the trip would be an understatement. The journey took a few hours, and as the train came into Paddington Station, I felt the overbearing fear set in. I knew there was something up, but couldn't figure out what. As I left the station, it was late at night. I was approached by a homeless man that must not have washed in years. His eyes were bleeding and his skin was flaking off. He seemed to know who I was, and he grabbed me by the shoulders. He screamed at me and his voice sounding like a death rattle. He told me to turn around immediately turned back and go to where I came from. He said that being in London would be the death of me. But before I could reply, a guard at the station grabbed him and carted him off. I tried to talk to them, but they told me to be on my way. I left for my uncle's house. After spending the night at my uncle's house, I woke up early and was collected by my driver, which had been arranged by my uncle the day before. The strange thing was, I had heard that the power station was brand new and very technological, but as we drove through some rusty gates, I read the sign that was barely hanging on by a thread. The sign read, Sewage. This was not a power company at all. It was a sewage company, and an old one at that. I couldn't see my driver properly, but I recognized his horrible and rattling voice. I tried to see him through the blacked-out window, but couldn't. I asked what was going on, but he said that there must have been a mistake, because this place had always been a sewage company. He dropped me off at the front door, and as I entered the withered and decaying front doors of the company, I looked back at the driver. It was the man from the station the day before. He smiled an eerie smile and drove off chuckling to himself. As I walked around, the first thing I noticed was the putrid and disgusting aroma that filled my lungs with a sickly sweet silage. I could barely breathe. Another thing I noticed was that there was in fact not a single person in the hallways of this big building. It looked like not a single person had stepped foot in the place for fifty years, let alone worked here. It seemed like a forgotten and disused wasteland inhabited only by the cobwebs of long-dead spiders and their prey. As I walked deeper and deeper into the building, the stench of the place got worse. It began to make me wretch. Suddenly, I heard a bone-chilling screech from down the hall. There was still no one I could see anywhere. I heard the noise again, this time louder and closer than before. It felt like the sound was creeping into my ears and tingling the hairs on the back of my neck. 
My stomach felt like it was turning over inside me because of the horrific and palpable smell in the air. I shouted, Who's there? Who is it? But there was not a reply. Just another sharp screech. This one made me jump so intensely I felt like my heart had skipped a beat. I ran back to where I had come from as quickly as possible, away from the gruesome scent and out of the dying hallways of this forgotten hellhole. As I was getting to the end of the door, I tripped and fell to the ground. It seemed like everything around me stopped. I slowly tried clamoring to my feet. Then from nowhere, I was pushed back to the floor. When I looked up, I saw a huge vision across the wall. It was the image of my dead parents, lying slain on the floor that they were murdered on. I scurried backwards across the floor in total fear, away from whatever this dark force was. Finally, I made it outside into the light. My driver was nowhere to be seen. Not a soul could be found as I ran around the complex looking for help. Nothing. After ten minutes of searching for a way out, I came to the rusted gates and the sign that hung off it. They were closed and locked. I climbed the gates and cut my trousers on the barbed wire around them. Someone had locked them. But who? My heart rate wouldn't slow and I headed for my uncle's house. When I arrived back at my uncle's over an hour later, he was so surprised to see me. He had been worried about where I had been. I told him, I've been to my interview, but my word, I must tell you what happened. Before I could start my story, he asked, But how did you get there? By the driver you arranged for me yesterday, I replied. But we didn't send a driver, remember? I was going to take you myself. It was then that I remembered my uncle had cancelled the driver as he wanted to come for moral support. I wanted to show my uncle what had happened, so I decided to take him to where I had been. I wanted to show him the decayed and disused sewage station. But it was not there. In its place was a state-of-the-art power station with over 1,000 employees, which I am now one of, and have been for 20 years almost. To this day, I have no idea how to explain who the driver was that took me, where he took me, or what happened that day. This happened when I was about seven years old. My grandparents lived in a small town in Arkansas. My parents and I used to visit them often, and during our trips, I used to go on these small hikes with my grandparents. That day, too, my grandparents and I went out for a hike on one of the new paths my grandparents had recently discovered. The part in which we used to hike was a wilderness, meaning no vehicles had access to it, and not many humans went there either. This trail was new to me. I'd never been there, but as we reached the end of the trail, I could immediately tell why my grandparents had chosen this spot. The trail ended on a bluff that overlooked a small river that flowed underneath it. This bluff was about 200 meters high and was a serene spot to sit and spend some time. On our return journey, I clearly remember spotting a waterfall a few meters away from our trail. It was about 11.30 a.m. and I desperately wanted to see the waterfall up close. My grandpa walked a few meters away from us to scout the path toward this waterfall, but there was no walkable path leading to this waterfall, so they both refused to take me there. I admit, I was a bit of a stubborn child back then. I cried and threw a tantrum in the middle of the forest. I sat on the ground and refused to move. My grandparents were used to my antics, so they just kept on walking ahead. Not too far, just far enough to show my seven-year-old self that they were leaving me behind. At some point, I knew that I was going to get my way. So, with my head hanging between my shoulders, I started walking again. I slowed down my pace on purpose, but I clearly remember my grandpa turning after short intervals to keep an eye on me to make sure I was walking right on the trail. It was broad daylight. When I raised my head to look at my grandparents, suddenly, they were not ahead of me. Instead, there was this line of huge trees, like a wall, and between them ran a small dirt trail. Given the fact that I hadn't been on this trail before, I thought this might be the right route. Besides, I had purposely slowed down. I was sure that my grandparents were up ahead, somewhere. 
I kept walking, and after maybe a couple of hours of walking, I could not find my grandparents or the way back home. I was a bit scared and exhausted, so I decided to sit on a nearby rock. After a few minutes, I decided to keep walking, and soon enough I reached the bluff that I had visited with my grandparents. It was weird that I had reached there again, but before I could decide to do anything, someone walked towards me from the tree line. Hello, she said. She reached up to my shoulder in height and had black hair and brown eyes. She was wearing a frock and looked friendly. Hello, I replied. Who are you? I asked. I'm Mary, said the little girl. She came and stood in front of me and asked, How old are you? I'm seven, and my name is Josh. I'm five. She seemed pretty harmless and not like my seven-year-old self knew any better. I was just happy to find someone there. We started talking and pretty soon we were good friends. By chatting with Mary, I quickly gathered that her parents were camping in the woods too. She and her family came to this part of the woods often, so she knew the way down. She had just started school and was struggling to make new friends, despite her funny jokes and sweet singing. She sang for me too and told me some very funny jokes. I thought that she was my new best friend. When the sunset was close, it was clear to me that I was lost and that Grandpa and Grandma would come for me, but I didn't know when. Mary agreed to stay with me for the night and to help me get back home in the morning. I was delighted indeed. We spent the night sleeping on the bluff, looking at the stars and sharing stories from our schools. She also brought me some berries from a nearby bush so I wouldn't be hungry. The next day, we climbed down the hill, and Mary, despite being smaller than me in age and size, was an expert hiker, almost as good as my father and grandpa. Whenever the path became steep, she stood in front of me to help me come down safely. When we were down later that afternoon, she took me to a small cave-like structure and asked me to stay there for the night. She also got me some fruits from some nearby trees and led me to a small stream to drink water. The next day, we had to walk a lot to reach the nearby street from where I could go home. When we reached the street, Mary told me that she was happy she met me. Till then, I didn't want Mary to leave and I wanted her to meet my parents. But she told me that she had to get back to her parents and they would be very angry if she didn't come back soon. Bye, Mary. Bye, Josh. We waved at each other and then she walked away, back into the forest. I was just sitting on a boulder when a small van passed me on the road. The driver stopped when he saw me sitting and jogged towards me in a hurry. There was another man in the van too. Hey, are you Josh Davis? The driver asked me. Yes, sir, I replied. Immediately, both the men exchanged a funny look and the other man rushed towards his van and made a few phone calls. Till then, the driver casually asked me where I was. I was in the woods, sir. I said, to which the man seemed unconvinced. Within minutes, police cars had arrived and, amidst the chaos, there was a car that I very much recognized. It was my father's car, and out of it stepped my parents and grandparents. I was surrounded by my whole family, and everyone was hugging me, kissing me, and whatnot. It was hard for me to understand what had happened. Wasn't it just the punishment my grandparents gave me because I was being stubborn? Soon I was taken to the hospital and some unnecessary tests were performed on me. When the doctors were done with me, everyone was asking me the same questions. Where was I and how did I end up on the corner of the road? So I told them the whole story of how I met Mary and how she helped me get down and how she was nice and funny and how she brought me food and told me stories about her school. Everyone, including my family, was baffled. I mean, I understand that it's odd to make friends in the woods, but... Mary was really nice. Then I was told that I had been missing for almost two days, and there was a search party looking for me. The men who found me by the road had been a part of this search, too. I didn't get it then, but now that I'm an old buzzard, I get how crazy all of it must have sounded. My story had made headlines, and now most of the people were worried about Mary, too, until a man who was around 70 years old came up to my family and demanded to speak to me. He claimed he was Mary's dad. I was eager to meet him because that meant I could meet Mary too. But what the man told me still shocks me to my core today. Mary was lost in those woods about 35 years ago at the same spot where I met her, and later her dead body was discovered. 
The girl who I assumed was my best friend was not a girl, but a ghost all along. He asked me to describe Mary in great detail, and when he was satisfied that I wasn't joking, he showed me a picture of Mary. It was an old, yellow, crumpled picture of her. I broke into tears. But as I grew up, and I kept on reanalyzing the story, I figured maybe the spirit of Mary Wilson didn't want to see another kid end up in the same situation she did. She wanted to save my life because no one saved hers. Maybe Mary was a kind spirit. But the sweet smile of that little girl who saved me all those years ago still haunts me to this day.